This series of lunchtime conversations intends to capture insights from some of society's thought leaders in these times. It's the 21st of May, and here in the UK, there's still a lot of uncertainty, but a real sense of beginning to end the lockdown plans and lockdown and planning and for the recovery. Part of my role at Warwick University is to make sure our education programmes remain relevant and continues to serve the needs of society. To do this, it's important to be part of the research and industry community and to be part of recognising how society's attitudes and behaviours may change in the long in the long run. The people I will speak to in this series, they form my professional network and I rely on them to inform and help steer our educational offerings. We've seen seismic shifts in all areas of life and, and the, the, um, the impact that COVID-19 has had will have lasting effects. With me today to discuss, I have Steve Street, Chartered Engineer, currently an AI expert for Innovate UK and formerly um, IT and security architect for IBM UK, the service science advocate and IBM Global Service Science Community of Practice lead. In addition, he's been part of the steering group for the Service Management and Design MSC. I've known Steve for probably just over 10 years, I would say, Why and he, a little bit longer than that, maybe. And he delivers lectures and supervises our MSC students. Steve, welcome to a virtual lunch. Um, Mari, thank you. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. It's, uh, I'm sorry that was such a long title. <laughs> well, it's, 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 it is a long title and your expertise is very much valued by myself, by our, our um, student community and, and the Warwick community wider. So thank you for sharing some of it. We've been in lockdown for a couple of months um, and on reflection, what do you think? What areas of life do you think have been impacted and when and what have been impacted most? Mm, there's, a, there's a good, good question. I think, uh, by the way, I think this is changing all, all the time. Uh, there was very clearly, I think, a panic period where people actually weren't just, hey, the toilet rolls, but lots of other things <laughs> disappeared. There's a long list of things that disappeared, including freezers, strangely enough, bread, flour, blah, blah. So there's a panic period. I think we've come out of that where people have found they're incredibly capable of adjusting. Um, the most you know, day to day thing, apart from children being at home, which doesn't affect us, but affects a lot of people, mm. is the famous uh, w working from home. Um, truth is, you know, IBM had been doing that. Essentially, you, had, you always ended up with very flat ears because you were always on the phone. Mm. You know, didn't run a business where you went into the office. But for a lot of people, that's very new. Um, I think there's quite a lot that could come out of that actually. I don't know if you want me to talk about it at the minute. One of the things that will certainly come out, well, two things will come out. One, finance directors will cut building costs. You know, yes. they close the offices. And you know, once the office closed, very hard to go into it. And the other thing, which is a longer term, a bit more pernicious effect, is you'll find in about three or four years' time, people are absolutely desperate to get into the office desperate to see each other. I mean, I'm a bit chatty, you can probably tell. That's what <laughs> happens when you're on the end of the phone all the time. Um, oh, and your friends, well, actually, when you meet people, even if they're your enemies, you're all having the most friendly chats because you're just desperate to speak people. People also don't build up their networks. Yeah. If you're a new person, you, you don't get to know how the place works. And that, in the end, becomes quite a pernicious thing. So there'll be balance, takes time. Mm. I hope yeah, I can see that. I can see that many of the teams that I work with, we've managed to maintain and we've actually created some short term teams really effectively. Um, mm. But I can see that that would be difficult to sustain over a longer period and um, without having just a little bit of the face to face and that connectivity you have by just being in the same space as other people. Okay. Um, you don't need to talk to each other every minute of every day. Sorry, I was interrupted there. Um, mm -hmm. and something IBM did was in 2017, just after I left, they had a back to the office move. Mm -hmm. And I can just imagine how thrilled some of the uh, people, <laughs> the marketeers who just moved to Colorado were to be summoned back into the office in New York State. Mm -hmm. but, you know, and that's because certain activities will do work better face to face. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Yes, and, and I guess that thing about the fear passing, you know, we are, we are, I think there's still a nervousness in the UK about, um, and it's difficult to f foretell 
how long that's going to sustain that nervousness. And I, I, I've noticed how quickly, um, and we've talked, I talked about this with Yeshim, and how quickly we forget, you know, we how quickly we've managed to adapt and forget um, even what happened, how anxious we may have felt a month ago, now that we're thinking about planning to come back, mm. the mood, the attitude has changed quite quickly and we've almost forgotten that emotional experience behind us. I find that quite interesting. Um, one thing that it appears to me that we, we've struggled in the UK, I don't know why, but we've really struggled to implement this kind of, I'm going to say it, test, track, trace, and presumably the fourth word is isolate, even though it doesn't have T. Um, and yet without a vaccine, it seems like it's about the only strategy that we have to live alongside the virus and not return to a crisis level. Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to implement this? And why, or why do you think it's so hard to implement this? And why is it so specific? Why has it been so specifically difficult in the UK when we've seen it effectively implemented in other places? Yes, I mean, I'm guessing that it's not actually such an easy thing to implement practically, logistically and so on. But to be honest, I think the, the main challenge, um, or well, put it another way, if you look at the places that are implemented it successfully, which were Korea, and I guess it's Singapore, I don't know, places like that, they had experience of SARS, they had experiences of coronaviruses. So what they were thinking, or their planning, was around the virus and handling a virus. And virus containment program works very well. We, in the UK, had done masses of planning, tons of planning, lots of stuff, but it was all based on pandemic flu. Not a stupid thing to plan for, I yep. mean, that it was much more likely it was going to be pandemic flu, but it wasn't. And when you've got a plan, you find it very hard to, uh, well, I'll put it another way, it's challenging to adjust and do, do what's necessary. And by the way, now, you know, the real answer to your question there is it's better if we didn't have to start from here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It would have been better to get our uh, to to get our mindset in in the right place. How, how, how challenging. I mean, how you know the idea that it's better if we didn't start from here. It's okay. difficult to look at the worldview and and determine how far should we roll it back, how far should we break down assumptions and look at our solution space. How big should we make yeah, it, solution. and how? And how tight should we keep it just to be able to get on with it? What well, have you had experience of that? What are your comments on that? Well, I do, I do think this solution space thing, thing is a really key, key, <laughs> key item. People have, a, look, the, the example I have is, is in our den, an exercise we did in our den. We didn't do many, but we did one. And what happened there is you put in a car, driven around, doop, dumped. You can tell you haven't been abducted because they weren't. So this is, I guess, this is sort of a team building exercise, is it? Or Yes. Yes. Was that was that kind of well, that was that was through IBM sort of corporate training team building? Is that yes? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It doesn't happen every day, but it, it, it <laughs> did in this case. And the thing is, the right answer was for your team to look around, spot the the building you wanted to get to was over there, just a little river in between, and wade wade across the river. Mm. And the problem we had was it never occurred to us for a second that we should cross the river. We should wade just couldn't imagine the company asking us to get our feet wet. <laughs> so we walked up the river for about three hours looking for a bridge and we found it about the same time as the search party found us. <laughs> so it was quite small scale. No, but I mean, a couple of things. You learn a lot from failure. We were spectacular failures. And the other thing is the problem was our mindset. It was our mind. We hadn't considered all the options. Mm. And that happens a tremendous amount. Um, oh, I'm not going to, no, 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 I won't tell you about it. Um, the, the cure for that is to, is to actually have your mind as open as possible, to consider things as completely as possible. And I want to mention Yesim, episode mm. 18, episode 8. She talked about play. There yes. are plenty of techniques for you know, opening your mind and investigating. She mentioned, mentioned that children look at things, everything's new. Yeah. And there's a lot to be said for doing that. Look objectively and look clearly and that'll give you about the best uh, steer you can get mm. um yeah oh gosh it's still a challenge but yes thank you because i guess there's still that mindset of wanting to um and i'm guilty of it you know to to wanting to to 
to to get on with it, you know, to and and I I think there is this is a time where we really ought to be. We need to get recovery in place, but we also need to have a really good understanding of what the landscape looks like now, not what we think the landscape looked like before and how we think it's going to be altered, but really see it for what it is. And I think that's challenging. I mean, it's very hard to improvise in an emergency, actually. People do, they have to. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the idea you can analyse anything in advance is everything in advance is just not on. You can't can't do it. But what you need to be is, is aware and sensing where change, where things are diverging from your assumptions. Yes. And mm. that's that's oh, Peter, the British Airways was on a couple of days ago. Mm. The key thing he point he made was there needed to be a lot of focus on the recovery. It was a subject in his own right. He mm. talked about having two teams. I think that's quite difficult. But, you know, uh, the key thing from my point of view would be to have put enough focus on finishing the activity rather yes. than starting it. Mm. Hmm. So, um, I guess um, in your role, I mean, in your current role, you work for Innovate UK. Um, um, and, and you are there sort of assessing some of their um, applications for funding to to um, to support some projects in AI with your with your AI expertise, artificial intelligence um, and I guess your background in cybersecurity and, and, and the connections with IT systems. Do you think that the research agenda will shift in its priorities going forward or do you think it it's longer term. Is this is the pervasive effect of COVID-19 going to really impact upon us in a really profound way socially and technologically and what our expectations are of the world? Um, or or is it has it had the impact and we are still who we were before and we just need to realign things? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, it, it's a, it's a it's a very good question. I think I think a key thing is we don't know yet. I mean, there's a famous quote from Zhou Enlai, who was the Chinese Vice Premier, that it was too early to say what the impact of the French Revolution was. And the point is, he may have misheard the question. Actually, apparently, they might have been talking about something else. But never <laughs> mind. The key point he made was these things take a long time to work through fully, and that yes. that's the truth of it. The second point really is I think there will be a struggle between an immediate desire to get back to 100% normality. I mean, I've seen things that say that American medical firms expect to get their profit margins back to, to normal within two months. That's one extreme of normality mm. and plenty of other. I think in the end, actually, there will be significant changes. Um, one of the most crucial, I mean, we've had a huge shock, basically. One of the most crucial is I think we, we realise how fragile some of our systems are. Yes. It's going to be a lot more attention to robustness, resilience and so on. I do believe, I do believe as well, specifically within that, the green agenda. Mm. I think there's a really huge opportunity there for several reasons. <laughs> One is it's a good thing and the yeah. other is actually it's a, a mean, there's going to need to be a lot of government support to get things back to normal. And the green agenda is a really good route for that government support. Yeah, yeah. Don, I mean, Don touched on some of that with really following through the implications of wanting to, if you want to, you know, change to a one-way system in a city, you have to then go about and re-implement all the bus stops and, and make the pavements wider. And the implications of doing these things, these good ideas, they do of course they, they translate into lots and lots of operational activity but thinking all that detail through and then having the government saying try to avoid public transport but uh, you know so will there be more cars I, you know you can see that it, it's it's a it really is quite an uncertain time for that that size of the, that side of things do you think there's more space for um digital solutions for ai for do you think there's more issues around cyber security or do you think it's just the same as it was before I don't know. Has it changed in, in principle? I mean, actually, yes. What's happened, I think, is there's been a number of trends which were happening anyhow, which have been brought forward. Mm -hmm. One of those trends was online retail. Very simple. We've discovered we can order almost anything online. Yes. You know, we, we're getting far more online than we ever used to. Um, mm -hmm. That will have an impact on the role of retail in its own right. 
it won't wipe it out, I think. But what you're likely to see is that shops, I think, become more of a, a showcase, a showcase for the online. Mm. So that's something that was happening anyhow, but it's probably been brought forward about five years. Yes. Um, and I think there's a lot of stuff in virtualization. I do believe it's quite likely people will have a little look at virtual worlds. There is a possibility of VR and AR because, I mean, what's happening if you're working remotely, you need things to make things concrete. And yes. those kind of tools provide means. Is there going to be a revolution? I sort of doubt it. Uh, I mean, people have apparently been getting married in World of Woodland or whatever, one of those virtual worlds. Yeah. And you're going to see a bit more of that, probably. Mm. Um, with things like AI, <laughs> actually, one of the key quotes is sorting out the uh, rubbish. Um, huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is from some billionaire in America, actually. That there are a lot of ideas that are around that people get funded, actually. Um, and uh, they've relied essentially on the goodwill of venture capitalists. I think the soft, soft bank in Japan or something, huge funders. There's going to be somewhat more caution there. And it's the better ideas that will uh, survive. Yes. You know, and yes, they'll come to fruition quicker than they would have done otherwise. Mm. So, I mean, and with the with your expertise with AI, cybersecurity, all these these kind of technical things. I know that you've got a passion for the arts and you support the arts as well. Um, and in this world, there's been this very, obviously we've seen the arts and digital come together and, and give, give people access to things that normally you'd require face to face. So theatres and, and choirs and music and performers. And it's been a much more intimate experience, although people might even have been more distanced in a strange way. And they're in people's kitchens listening to them sing rather than um, mm. going to a large concert hall with where they're just a face of thousands. And um, well, do you think that do you think that mixing of the the digital enabling these is experiences and um, this engagement with art? Do you think that's going to and um, that will also grow? Will it grow as quickly or do you think it's a kind of a, you know, it's, it's a hit and then that's it. It's going to wane away again. I, I don't think it'll wane away or put it another way. I think it will wane away to a degree, but it's a change that's, that's certainly again been accelerated. I mean, the Royal Opera House apparently were mainly using cinemas, blah, blah, because they the, the Opera House was full anyhow. They yeah. couldn't get to anybody else without going online without doing something virtual like that national theatre didn't do so much of it i find it really hard to believe that when they've had you know millions of people watching one man two governors i can't believe they're not going to make that one of their routine ways of doing things mm. um rsc are on marquee tv i know you're talking to the lady soon and it would be interesting to see what see with her perspective so i think art is going to go more digital so this is real art going more digital there is already digital art around that probably will it will it i think it becomes more of a serious contender it's a very yes. fringe thing at the minute and maybe it becomes more of a serious contender for people i mean the real ultimate is for people to start creating new new art forms in the digital world um, and to a certain degree they actually already do that in second life and things like that you know there are people who run businesses where they create you know create skins actually so that uh, you you can adopt the skin of their character Ooh, so is that like that. <laughs> okay, it sounds good yeah yeah you can choose choose to look yeah. like whatever you want uh, i haven't done it recently but yeah <laughs> i can look like me there so <laughs> um, <laughs> I noticed that I mean in Coventry you know we've got the City of Culture coming up in 2021 and I noticed that even our research calls more locally regional research calls have been around any ways that we can engage with local artists and um, with providing some research or some technical support or or even technical research so maybe looking at virtual reality or, or augmented reality and how it can be applied so I've noticed a short shift you know shift already um, with the calls that we see I've got a couple of questions um, yeah. from Tim and um, he's kind of in interested in the sort of limitations of the service based business model. So it's kind of a, a quite a general question. But do mm -hmm. you think that the sort of this idea of developing a relationship over a period of time with a service contract and um, as opposed to selling an asset and then providing after sales service, do you think that's been um, negatively impacted or will it will there be a growth in that area or is it a kind of a 
is it a bit of a, a wonder between what's right for what company? Well, we could always say yeah, it's a balance and it uh, mm. depends on, on your context and all that kind of thing. I do think in general, it's better to build a relationship with the customer. So services, yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking Pat Rolls always do power by the hour. They've still suffered because the fundamental demand has gone. So you can't mm. make it for that. But can you leverage more of what you've got by having a relationship with the customer? Yes. On the other hand, you can't do that if you've nothing to offer anyhow. Mm. You have to have a real product or really a real something concrete, an objective, be it soft services or hard yes. hardware that you have to can deliver. Mm. I don't know, is that a good answer? I think so. I think I'm going to take from that back to maybe one of the first conversations we ever had okay. around making sure it's about value and generating value. Right. And it doesn't really matter whether you do that digitally, through an experience, through a product. If you can't work with your customer to, to let them achieve an outcome, then you've got nothing. You've got nothing there as a business anyway. So um, I'm going to I'm going to return back to maybe the first conversation we might have had um, mm -hmm. some years ago now. <laughs> well, um, I get thank you very much for sharing these insights. You know that I'm going to use them to help steer our education programmes. I always have done. Okay. Um, for our current students, there might be a little bit of data in there that they might use for their current research projects. And for the wider Warwick community, thank you very much for sharing. The insights are valuable. And if anybody listening would like to hear more from Steve, then please drop me a line and I'll forward on. I'm on Warwick's website, and if you're watching this on YouTube, follow the link on the closing slide. And the series will also be made available as a podcast. Just search Insights Over Lunch on your preferred listening platform. Thank you very much, Steve. No more to say apart from yeah, bon appetit. Enjoy your lunch. Bon appetit. Thanks, thanks very much. It's been fun, and I hope it's been interesting and even useful to some, some people. Yeah, thank you. It's